Welcome to Five Shot Weekly. Brilliant Joseph Martinez news, and unfortunately, a center back transfer that doesn't seem meant to be. All that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Shot Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Mark. And wherever it is you get your pods, subscribe, share, and leave us a good rating. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Atlanta United have officially unveiled the 2020 primary kit, dubbed the Black Kit with a V in the middle, signifying Chapter 5 for Atlanta United. And yes, they did it in grand style with a drive-in kit launch event that yours truly and Mark was at. Uh, definitely had a kind of Friday night kind of drive-in movie feel for sure, which was uh, pretty dope. And uh, of course, it was at the Home Depot backyard. If you haven't watched our vlog, you can check it out here with the I button. Or if you're a listener, just hop over to our YouTube But Either way, there were some celebrities that showed up. Uh, Of course, Darren Eels, Jeezy, Joseph Martinez, Miles Robinson, and of course, our new gaffer, Gabriel Hainsey. Excuse me. And uh, oh, a little bit of a kind of uh, cameo by Justin Veltes as well, the uh, translator. (laughs) But, yeah. uh, you know, that's uh, always great to see him uh, still kicking around and, you know, translating for our mm-hmm. Spanish speakers. But, uh, yeah, Lasers, Atlanta United Chance, uh, you know, definitely a good night all in all. Uh, very kind of really chill, kind of very like a good vibe, I would say. But what were your uh, what were your takeaways from this event, Mark? Yeah, it, it really was a good vibe. Like I was, uh, I was curious to see what the crowd would be like, and it was very, you know, chill. Uh, and it was, I mean, that parking lot was almost full. I mean, we were like towards the back. I think we got there around what seven thirty. So uh, you know, by then it uh, almost completely filled out. So, but it was some cool, people had though. been I mean, there by like five, five fifteen or something like that. Apparently, right, yeah. right, <laughs> right. But it was just, you know, I thought it was just like a typical United crowd. You know, you had. Uh, um, Groups of like three or four who obviously came in the same car, you know, and you'd assume that everyone's uh, practicing, mm-hmm. you know, safe practices. Um, and then like at the event itself, too, I noticed like most people or pretty much everyone had their masks on, even if they were walking around a little bit. So that was cool. But yeah, you saw like families, you saw like uh, groups of young adults, you saw like everyone just excited just to like, you know, just be close to the stadium and be like, the, the, like a team related event. Um, and then when Joseph came on the stage, you saw like people like go get as close to the stage as possible just to like take a picture of Joseph, just to see him. And so, you know, I think uh, the love between uh, Joseph and the fan base is genuine. And to me, that was just another example. Um, so it was cool. It was a cool event overall. Uh, and not one that a lot of MLS teams would do. I mean, like literally the next day, Miami released uh, one of their kits, and it was just basically like a couple videos and a couple posts from David Beckham. Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think well, that's just gonna give you a little more, right? I mean, Florida definitely. Uh, well, they haven't been, you know, uh, practices wise, been doing you know the best in terms of safety, but uh, so that could be why they didn't want to gather people in a way but uh, georgia yeah. kind of up there as well so sure but uh it's also though uh t- the kit you know uh we we talked about it a little bit in the video uh but uh yeah i think seeing it on gz with all his garb his chain his hat his sunglasses uh you know doing the turnaround rubbing his hands i mean pretty much that will uh sell a lot of people there in terms of mm-hmm. you know how cool it looks uh, I think a lot of people are still maybe on the fence, but we'll see. I think, uh, you know, the more we see these players in it, it kind of, uh, it's like the king kit for me. It'll pretty much uh, kind of drive up the interest of it eventually where it's like, all right, yeah, all right, I'll get it, you know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, you know, there's no real surprises, obviously, but like seeing it on the players, especially for me, I was like, yeah, okay, I could get used to this, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's uh, yeah, definitely with the stocks, uh, with the 
uh, the way it is on the trim on the top and also on the sleeves for the actual kit itself uh, with the black shorts I mean yeah it's a it's a good look it's definitely on the more clean side which is aka sometimes code for boring but uh right. it also yeah i mean overall uh if they're gonna lean it into the kind of thing that they're going into with like lasers i can kind of go down with that it's uh you know not not the worst that they've uh come up with to a degree i i love i contend i contend, and this might be kind of divisive but I contend that that first away kit, even though it looks good by itself, but as a full kit, that strawberry concrete is by far our worst kit. <laughs> I don't like it. I yeah. really don't. I'm so. Yeah. And uh, no offense to the people who went out and got it. You know, if you like it, that's cool. It's just yeah. not my thing, man. Yeah. Uh, whereas, and like another thing for me, like the names are important. So like, I love the King Peach, and like mm. you know, just everything about that kit is perfect. Of course, 2018 and 19 were very successful as well. Um, but yeah, the black kit, love it. I'm here for it, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, let's roll with the black kit. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, the next two years will be as successful as the King Peach years. Yeah, and so uh, speaking of uh, well, black kits or black out kits. So the black people call uh, you know, black players for change rather uh, MLS. They came out with a limited edition uh, blackout collection. Uh, also with uh, the Participation Trophy Studio uh, with this blackout kit that uh, for LA United, that Miles Robinson is rocking here. Uh, oh, yes, yes, indeed. It's more of a gray, but either way, I dig the hell out of it. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's only one, and those proceeds raise money for FC Harlem. Uh, and we'll have that link down below in our description uh, so that you can enter the contest, essentially. But uh, ooh, when I saw this, oh my god! Like, we gotta we gotta find some way for them to produce more of these, cause yeah, um, it's kind of like a parlay kit in a way, where you know it's uh, very much in that type of line. Uh, this looks more like the King's kit, I would say. It's just more blackout, obviously. But right. ooh. Boy, I, I, uh, I want it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I love the, uh, the combination of a great design and a great meaning behind it, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's where you really see the culture as we refer to it, uh, kind of, I guess, show its best. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I really enjoy that aspect of it. You know, it's, it's creative and then, you know, it, having a great story behind it, I think only adds layers to it. It kind of reminds me of uh, what Atlanta United is doing uh, in terms of sort of extending Black History Month and mm -hmm. uh, those uh, cleats that they've designed. I mean, like, you know, that's a you know great combination of like the, the culture, you know, the meaning behind it. Um, I don't know. They're just seeing these initiatives is, is just very exciting for me personally. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna win the jersey. Uh, I doubt I have some. I, I doubt they're gonna show up at my door with some uh, with those cleats. But uh, it, it is very cool to see, like MLS at Lane United, etc. You know, putting in that that uh, genuine effort, and it, it comes off as authentic. Yeah. Oh hell yeah. And uh, yeah, some really really dope gear that they've uh, been pushing out as well in terms of that. So really, uh, yeah keep uh if they keep going along this line yes that's uh very very good uh, and if they want to exceed that that'd be great too but uh, anyway so let's uh move on to uh so uh, kind of rife with controversy at the moment uh although you know now uh in terms of some different news along with that i'll allude to this other thing that might come into light uh makes this a little bit more dampened but Either way, let's get into it. In terms of, uh, so Miles Robinson, George Bellow, and Brooks Lennon were called up for the U23 U.S. Men's National Team for the CONCACAF Olympic qualifying. They came out with a graphic and everything, but uh, so unfortunately, LA United, uh, well, maybe fortunately, depending on who you are, uh, they pretty much rejected the call. Uh, and so 
uh, kind of pretty much citing because of the CONCACAF Champions League uh, coming up, but also some COVID stuff in terms of the quarantine. Uh, even though if the last match would have be at the end of this month, they would still have to quarantine to be able to get back and be ready for uh, you know the first match in on April 6th. But it's also you know kind of prying away i think pretty much uh at least two nailed on starters and mm -hmm. uh another one that's arguably going to have a, a sharding st starting shout uh sharding uh did i say sharding oh my god but anyway uh starting sh start oh my god uh anyway so basically those three players have a large role to play in this team and yeah when you have a new coach coming in, it's massive that you get that preseason with them uh, and so that they can yes. kind of go with the system that is going to be played and not be away for any certain amount of time because that will pretty much unsettle a lot of uh, what we're trying to do. And so uh, that could be a large part of that as well. That wasn't really said by, you know, by the team or uh, by the U23 head coach Jason Kreis, who, uh, yeah, apparently did say that uh, he did know about the uh, the rejection over the weekend, uh, even though it was announced on a mm -hmm. Monday, uh, and that he said, as a former MLS coach, I have to respect that. Uh, also, to note, he is also currently the head coach of the USL League One club, Fort Lauderdale uh CF and so uh, it's not necessarily one for one but there is a little bit of a conflict of interest slightly uh, with Inter Miami because Inter Miami owns that uh, you know Fort Lauderdale CF squad or team right. and so uh, right. there is you know just a little bit of that if uh, we did have pretty much at least two nailed on starters go away for that amount of time that definitely benefits a little bit Enter Miami. If it was one, okay, maybe, maybe, but um, it also uh, said that, uh, so Christ said that having those three players not be in camp does create doubt if they will be picked for the Olympic team should the U.S. qualify. Uh, and he said that if they were in camp, he said there would be no doubt they would be selected. But this is also the thing. They pretty much, uh, <laughs> like, Miles Robinson and George Bello played for the U.S. men's national team this Past exactly. month. So I yeah. think they're probably good. But uh yeah, Brooks Lennon there, is is probably the only casualty in this kind of respect. But I mean maybe, for the players yeah. it might be a little bit of a, a letdown to a degree. But uh yeah, what what are your thoughts so far? No, I mean uh they're obviously held in high regard in terms of uh the US men's national team pool in general. And you know, I've alluded to this before. The first match of the season, that match in Costa Rica, is going to be the most difficult match we have in the opening months, I feel, unless, you know, unless they advance in Champions League. Um, and so to have, like, two, not only two starters, but two starters out of your back line, possibly three, if Brooks Lennon is, you know, a shout to start a right back, let's say. That's too much to, you know, to have to try to replace and deal with um, all in one. And so, and then the, the COVID only complicates the whole process of them traveling uh, to, would this be in Mexico? Um, mm -hmm. Them traveling and then coming back or then going on to Costa Rica. Like, uh, you know, it just, and then having them miss the practices and so on especially for a new coach, as you, as you alluded to, I think the, the club is ultimately backing their manager with this. And I really have no problem with it. I mean, it's like this. If Bello and Robinson go on to have good seasons, I would love to see Jason Kreis be like, well, they weren't in Olympic qualifying, so I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Like, nobody would go for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just, I think he's posturing now just because, like, you know, he's just doing that in the present and he doesn't have to deal with that until it comes up. But if and yeah. when it comes up, you know, and I hope they make it to the Olympics. And I would, I would, I would love to see Robinson and Bello in the Olympics. But right. I think Elena made the right move here. Yeah, it's also a little bit of job preservation probably for Christ as well. He's got to, 
he's got a uh, you know for optics say his piece a little bit. Uh, but of course, yeah, this isn't the first time Atlanta United have rejected some call ups. Uh, he also rejected the call ups in January of 2020. Uh, Miles Robinson, of course, famously got injured doing some wind sprints with Greg Berhalter's uh, U.S. Men's National Team squad. Yeah. Mark's face tells it all, tells this whole story <laughs> right now. But uh, it's definitely, yeah, like, then that cost us definitely, I think, in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, we didn't have Miles Robinson for a crucial playoff run. Uh, you know, and we still almost got to the MLS Cup final. I mean, that's, I think that, that speaks that's volumes on, yeah, on the type of player that uh, Robinson probably could have, uh, you know, been the difference possibly in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, they'll have some replacements. They'll have some players that could, you know, maybe play a part. So I think they will be okay. I don't, there's a lot of people on Twitter that made a lot of hoopla about it, lambasted LA United, saying that uh, they will live to regret this or something. Uh, I think regarding Miles Robinson and George Bello possibly, like, not getting more transfer value because they're, uh, you know, uh, playing in an international tournament. But, I mean, they just played in an international tournament last or this past month. And so, uh, well, you know, I think they will be okay. Uh, there will be other times in a non-COVID type of situation that we can see them play a part for the international team. But uh, I just want to say a quick word on that. Yeah. I mean, in terms, even purely from a transfer value perspective, I think the best thing is that they stay with a... Uh, a highly respected coach in Gabriel Ense, and they play with the team as they try to embark on a Champions League run. I mean, like, we know that European teams are watching MLS games, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, you have to figure that they're probably going to watch those MLS teams against the other teams in the region, and they're not missing out. No, I, I completely reject that argument. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's arguably a kind of inferior type of uh, kind of competition in a way. Uh, if you're yeah usually if you're going for u23 players against u23 players essentially it's like it's going to be a little bit less of a competition that's just kind right. of the facts of it but anyway let's move on to Carlos Bocanegra talking about uh Atlanta United's preseason starting and a bunch of kind of news and notes uh first off with that is the big one with Joseph Martinez being fit and available for selection for the first game of the season on April 6th uh, and that's huge if he is able to play a part uh, or start even. That would be fantastic. Everyone's looking forward to Jose Martinez being able to get back. Of course, though, uh, like we said in the last episode, there are going to be complications with his ACL injury. Hopefully it's not really too big of a deal throughout the year. And actually, if there are no complications, that'd be fantastic as well. But... Uh, <laughs> Pretty much with uh, Jose Martinez, that's huge news because that pretty much means, yeah, uh, if he can get through the preseason healthy, the return of the king is fully on. Right? Indeed. So, uh, yes, 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 yes. moving on from that, uh, Carlos Bocanegra also said that Atlanta United will play four to five preseason friendlies all in the Atlanta area. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, that's obviously kind of, uh, kind of, pretty much bigger news in a way uh, I would say than uh, previously in last week where there wasn't talk of any preseason friendlies but uh, that there will be four or five I imagine though that the competition will just be local teams and so yeah. it will not teams, that sort of thing yeah and that's where it's kind of unfortunate where we won't be able to really test ourselves uh, you know that's gonna be an issue I feel like still it's going to be glorified scrimmages, you feel, you know. Right? Pretty much. So just, it is what it is. They got to take what they can get, but yeah, it's yeah. not ideal. Definitely not. Yeah, it will uh, be a stark difference between what we will face against Alajolense. So uh, that will be a thing. Uh, also, Boca said that Gabriel Hainse has played an active role in LA United's roster reconstruction this offseason. And that, uh, yeah, even before he formally accepted the job, he was making plans on how the squad could be strengthened. I think you could see that with, you know, the players that we dropped almost pretty much immediately when the season ended. 
uh, and you know there are uh, certain signs where <laughs> I think you would see with the amount of Argentines that we brought in that uh, yes he definitely has <laughs> some uh, some say in that for sure. Right. Uh, right. And Boca also said that they're still looking to add one or two guys to the roster, and uh, I think that's obvious with uh, some of the transfer rumors that we will uh, talk about, especially with that rumor uh so far of uh yeah that kind of pertains to that u.s men's national team uh u23 kind of uh situation but anyway uh right. moving on from that sam stechgall uh has an update about uh franco ibarra and that he might be uh very likely a u22 young money player so that final decision will be made before the start of the 2021 season. So I would imagine then if he is, then that means, yeah, we have all three spots pretty much, I think, uh, lined up in that U22 uh, Young Money Initiative with mm -hmm. Sosa, with Eric Lopez, and of course, Franco Ibarra, if that is true. So uh, we mm -hmm. will probably not be bringing another player in with that regard. If we do, it might be buying down Marcelino Moreno and then getting yeah. another DP. If that yep. is the case. So we shall see. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's get to what we were alluding to in Lataro Gianetti, the Velez Sarsfield defender who seemingly was on his way this uh, early this week. He even retweeted a post uh, of him leaving Argentina for Atlanta. Uh, he was at the airport. He was on a plane. So and then, then came the bombshell. So... <laughs> Last night at uh, around 7 or so on a Tuesday, uh, Gianetti reportedly from uh, Augustin Cilio, he did not pass his medical and apparently will not be able to sign with Atlanta United. Uh, Hainse reportedly still wants him though and it's kind of pretty much a flashpoint in this whole thing. We have to determine if we want to sign an injured player. Uh, and if we do, or not injured, but maybe with at least a um, kind of injury issue that's definitely cropped up, obviously, with that medical. Right. Um, and whether it's that you know repaired ACL knee or not, uh, there is reportedly something, uh, you know, I think that had something to do with that. So we shall see what it actually is. But if he doesn't become an LNI player, uh, then there are some implications, but if he does, we probably have to uh, renegotiate for sure uh, with Belez and figure out, uh, you know, what that actually is. Probably much lower transfer fee if we do try to push through the transfer. But it seems like though, um, at least with uh, you know what Felipe Cardenas has reported that. He can't 100% confirm that report, but uh, that the details are hazy, but the deal is unlikely to be completed. And so, yeah, it might be back to the scouting board for Atlanta United. And that, uh, yeah, would really make it really pretty difficult. Obviously, there are some things that we will have to face in terms of maybe rising transfer fees because everyone in the world is going to know that we're yep. in for a center back. Yep. <laughs> and we've already been linked to two uh, fairly high profile players. And so, yeah, everyone knows. Um, what can you say? I mean, like we've been football fans for a long time. We know how the these uh, the transfer mill works or can work. You know what I mean? You think a deal's done and then something comes up um i guess this hasn't really happened to many united uh before this, yeah, not too like, often in terms of like not, injury uh, not like that right but. and a player reaching this point in the transfer i mean like yeah. he effing traveled man <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. uh so it's uh ooh, it's a tough it's a tough bill to swallow i mean they're gonna have to throw this search into overdrive basically i think they're gonna have to search for a, a def at least one more uh defender you know i think I, with the time that's remaining i guess it's about a month until uh our first match so i think that's just like just enough time to maybe find a player and get him in and all that mm -hmm. and uh, we'll see what's uh in terms of what they end up having to pay yeah it's difficult yeah. because it was <laughs> yeah. 
maybe going to be about three million, which is really, uh, uh, in terms of MLS money, yes, a lot. But I think all in all, for uh, in the world transfer fees, it's not that crazy. But it's also a 27 right. year old and you know an Argentine league. Right. But uh, yeah, uh, you might ask though, maybe Fernando Mesa, he's on loan with Defensa y Justicia, uh, with that uh, loan to buy option that he's on. Could we recall him? But I see that probably we're very likely to probably look for someone else who's more of a kind of a long, long-term fit for our team. Uh, and it'd be kind of awkward to bring it back almost in like two weeks. That it's yeah. just, uh, yeah. I mean, these things happen, and so you know we'll have to uh, just kind of roll with the punches here. But uh, yes, it absolutely does. Yeah, very much suck. Uh, but um, you know, also. Darren Eels was on the call-up with Susanna Collins and Jillian Sakovitz, and uh, he did. He hinted a little bit at the Hector David Martinez, uh, you know, kind of transfer fall-through, and that he did warn that no deal is done until the paperwork is signed. And yeah, I mean, that's like he recorded that before this uh, happened, obviously. So it's uh, yeah, I think Joe Patrick, I think uh, of uh, Dirty South Soccer, pretty. Apple said that it feels like ominous foreshadowing, and uh, yeah, it definitely kind of feels a little bit that way. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is kind of par for the course, though. Like, I've dealt with this uh, in terms of my fandom for other teams as well, with uh, Arsenal and Kim Kallstrom, who uh, pretty much had a broken back when he was brought in as an Arsenal player, and he played, like, all of like a couple matches and uh, was actually uh, featuring in a penalty shootout. But still, either way, it is just not ideal when you uh, have to do this. And oh boy, it's uh, I've, yeah, just having seen this before, it's as frustrating as you can imagine. And uh, for it to happen to another team that I support, very much annoying. I am... <laughs> Very annoyed right now, but <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on. At least you didn't actually sign the player. Dude. I know, this is true. Well, we, we don't know. We are still determining if we are, right, I guess. so. Right, right. Uh, right. <laughs> anyway, so moving on to another transfer rumor. Uh, Matias Benitez uh, is already in Atlanta, says Felipe Cardenas. Uh, the 20-year-old Ford, he arrives from River Plate 2. Uh, it's not official yet but uh yes he would be on a one-year loan uh with Atlanta United 2 and he is a uh yeah a Ford that we would uh pretty much have an option to buy for 75 percent of his rights uh, he has four goals in 23 games uh yeah and a market value of around 250,000 so yeah not too crazy Atlanta United 2 player maybe with potential to Possibly, uh, you know, get into the first team if he does well. Uh, let's move on from that to Darwin Mateos. An update on that situation, according to Chris Smith. Uh, the delay is getting the uh, isn't visa related, but it's kind of pretty much something with his passport. So uh, we shall see. But that Venezuelan uh, winger uh, does look tasty for the. Uh, LA United 2 squad, so if we get him in, uh, you know, and then he shows out, maybe we have some more uh, cover, in a way, uh, on the wings as well, if we need it. If we can, at any point, <laughs> swap players between LA United 1 and LA United 2. But uh, anyway, so uh, let's move on to LA United 2 in that regard, where uh, the kind of alignment has been pretty much moved around a little bit. The twos will now compete in the Central Division in 2021. Uh, yeah, in the past, yeah, you know, there we were in the East. We played the likes of Charleston Battery, Tampa Bay Rowdies, like, constantly. It's going to be weird not facing those type of teams. And uh, some argue that we might have gotten the easier of the divisions in the East. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, you have any quick thoughts on what... Uh, what that uh, alignment uh, is gonna do for the you know the twos, if anything? Uh, I don't, to be honest. I mean, um, 
because I'm not that familiar with the with that division. But yeah, it would be weird not uh, not seeing the. I mean, would they only play teams in their conference or in their division, or would they? Uh, would it be like it's just heavy on divisional teams, and then occasionally you play? You know. Yeah, it's a little bit of both, but I think you know you, right. you more heavily uh, play against those teams in your division. So yeah, right, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how like yeah, it'll be a new set of teams, teams that maybe aren't as familiar with them. Yeah. So uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how they compete. If it's easier, if it gives them, if it gives them a better chance at the postseason, um, great. I mean, like Elaine and I have been making moves for two for the twos as well. So in theory, they should be better. So right, I think uh, they'll be one to watch this season. Right. And speaking of moves for the twos, uh, before that anyway, uh, <laughs> one actual one that actually came through, well, before it wasn't, uh, the two Lanus boys, Marcelino Moreno and Rocco Rios Novo, uh, they were seen in an IG story in recovery in the pool. Uh, and I kind of ingest joke that uh, it's day 202. Uh, who knows how many days it was actually, but... Uh, of Novo pretty much not being announced, but uh, yeah, he had been pretty much, he's been chilling for like a month and a half in Atlanta, training with the boys, not being announced, playing Call of Duty, <laughs> I mean, just like, he's pretty much on the team, and uh, Ellie right. and I was just like, mm, yeah, whatever, but then, uh, pretty <laughs> much an hour after I, I tweeted that, they pretty much announced that Rocco Rios Novo uh, comes in officially on loan from Lanus for the 2021 championship season. And uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, Steven Glass is uh, very excited for him. He's been uh, a mainstay in Argentina's youth national team since he was 15. Uh, he's also, he was born in LA, and so he, you know, is a dual citizen, so that's fantastic. Uh, and he's played such a kind of big part of Argentina's youth national teams that it's a very much a good get. I mean, it's long rumored, but yeah, finally, Rocco Rios Novo is official. But uh, what are your thoughts on Novo? Uh, and do you have high hopes for him? Um, I don't know if I would place high hopes on. Uh, yeah, I guess I kind of do. Uh, in terms of a long-term replacement of the goalkeeper position, you know, because I guess that's ultimately like the way, the best case scenario for this move. Uh, so yeah, I am curious. I, I'm just curious to see, you know, I hope he can uh, earn a starting spot for the twos and then we can actually like see him get consistent playing time. Um, that's mostly what I want to see in 2021. But uh, yeah, it is interesting. I guess it was a little bit of a saga. I mean, it wasn't really a saga. It just, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they uh, delayed on making it official and what have you, but uh, I mean, you know, it didn't fall through on, on like the Genetti move, so <laughs> true. Thank Jeez, God. man. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank God for that. Uh, indeed. Um, I I, uh, I have high hopes for him, uh, obviously with that pedigree, but I do wonder about him being slightly undersized. I believe he is only 5'11", uh, so, you know, as a goalkeeper that's not massive and so he hopefully will continue to grow uh, i think most people uh, men continue to grow until possibly uh, anyway until in their early 20s in terms of maybe like 21 or something so maybe hopefully he uh, grows and sprouts you know a couple more inches but who knows uh but either way uh yeah he does look like to be a talent though and so it's massive that you know we'll have someone uh pretty much fighting for minutes with the twos um but let's get to uh somewhere where you know maybe we might see some of uh, these players kind of play for the first team when we do play in this competition the u.s open cup policy has changed uh, in terms of the amount of foreign players so uh it used to be a limit of five players in an 18-man squad it's no more uh, the policy change has been approved by the National Council of U.S. Soccer. And that was an 83.51% uh, change of the vote, and now it's official. So that, yeah, in the past we had to limit our squad to uh, pretty much, yeah, just a few of our international players. And so we saw a lot of rotation usually. 
AK also Tata Martino didn't take the competition very seriously and uh, played the likes of Zach Lloyd and you know those type of players that are trivia questions now. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but definitely uh, or like Mark Bloom or you know those type of players. Anyway, um, even Miles Robinson got a shout in that time where yeah possibly he, he wasn't didn't. maybe the most ready. I would say. But, right, right, yeah, yeah. But definitely, yeah, this changes it for sure. It makes it, uh, I think, doubly harder for, I think, USL and, uh, you know, uh, lower division teams. But yeah. I think it's going to be a good change. What do you think? Agreed. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, certainly those USL teams, but even, I think, uh, MLS teams that don't really spend that much, that are not going to have that many international players, maybe they're at a disadvantage as well. But you have to keep in mind that the US o the winner of the US Open Cup competes in the Champions League. So it is kind of a big deal, uh, not to mention it's a trophy. And so I think uh, for those teams that do uh, go out and stack their rosters, um, you know, it's an opportunity for them, you know, to, again, to win a trophy and to, I think, be rewarded for taking the competition seriously. So, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, there's multiple ways to look at it. Obviously, as I'm a United fan, um, I'm not going to kick up a fuss about it. You know? so, <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> the team, like, almost like, what, like 80% largely internationals? And it's like, yeah. Right, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a very yeah, rough number, uh, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it probably ultimately makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, moving on from that into kind of very, very local anyway, uh, Georgia Alliance FC has hired Greg Garza, old five striper uh, Greg Garza, uh, as the director of player development. Uh, and it's good to see him kind of pretty much planting his roots back in Atlanta uh, to kind of build a next generation of, you know, the Georgia soccer. And, uh, but. It does kind of worry me. I mean, pretty much for FC Cincy, he didn't really play a large part for them as well. He was often injured, which has unfortunately been the case for him. He has been, yeah. unfortunately, Mr. Glass a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I mean, at only 29, that's very perplexing to see that as well. But yeah. uh, still, you know, he's got a lot of experience as a nomad, as a soccer player. So... Yeah, he will definitely have a lot to glean and uh, to really develop the talent in and around Georgia. So definitely really, really good to see. Any thoughts before we wrap this baby up? Uh, no, it's just it's cool to see. Yeah. And like you said, um, you know, especially someone who's been around to come back to Atlanta of all places, you know, uh, I think it kind of shows you that he did have an affinity for this place. Um, and, you know, maybe I, I don't know anything. I just want to make that clear. But maybe he's considering an early retirement. You know, I feel like mm -hmm. players who especially struggle with injury, you get to a point where it's like you're tired of going through that particular process of recovering from injury and, um, you know, getting back into the team and so on. And uh, I imagine that's not a lot of fun at all. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I hope I hope Greg is doing well overall. And, yeah, it'll be exciting to see what kind of impact he makes on um, the local soccer team. Yes, indeed. So that does it for the news and pretty much the episode except for the question of the day. So the question of the day is, did the black kit reveal sway your opinion on the new kit as it often does when it's modeled by our players? Let us know in the comments below. So, guys, that does it for the show. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. For Mark, I'm AJ. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah.